Okay, good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. We get into our studying together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much once again for this time that you've given us to study and read and learn. Lord, I pray that uh, Lord, you will minister to us, you will speak to us, oh God, we open our hearts, we open our minds to receive from you this morning, Lord, uh, even as we learn about church planting, things that are involved, and I pray, God, that uh, you will, Lord, just put a new desire, put a new uh, a new desire in our heart to do what you have called us to do, Lord, we pray, God, that you will empower us, and uh, you will strengthen us, you will encourage us, exhort us today, Lord, through your word. We thank you for doing this, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Uh, so last class, we uh, did up to chapter 18. Uh, we looked at uh, the spiritual aspects uh, when it comes to church planting. And we also looked at uh, some of the natural aspects initially, then we looked at spiritual aspects, which is really important uh, when it comes to you know, uh, ministry, and especially church planting. Uh, so we saw that how the enemy blinds people, the, the enemy holds people in bondage, the, uh, Satan hinders the proclamation of the gospel, and then he weakens the church by infiltrating through different areas within the church. Uh, chapter 18, we looked at um, exercising that is praying and exercising authority uh over uh, 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 for spiritual transformation that is praying for the lost and we look at spiritual warfare that is uh you know through prayer worship prayer uh, intercession and even as we do all of this always uh you know stand in a place of victory right uh, remember you're, you're you're fighting the devil you're fighting the works of the enemy, uh, but you're not fighting it alone, right? There will be days which will be really hard. There will be days where you'll just be able to overcome these challenges. But remember, your stand and my stand as believers, as ministers of God, is a stand of victory, right? So when you function out of that, uh, understanding out of that identity that hey i'm already victorious satan has been defeated satan has been crushed uh, the devil has no authority over me god himself the lord jesus himself has said go and reach out and and, and i will build my church the gates of hell shall not prevail against it so then we uh we begin to walk in this place of authority right uh, uh but even as we do that we learned last class that uh we need to close all entry points for the devil, right? Uh, uh, yes, we're doing the work of, of the ministry, we're uh, doing God's work, but we are human beings, right? We will make mistakes. Uh, there will be temptations, there will be challenges. So we close all kinds of entry points, right? Now, especially, uh, you know, in leadership, or you're pioneering a church, you're in this place of leadership, uh, it's very easy to, open doors to the enemy right now uh, because there's nobody to question you there's sometimes there's no accountability uh, you know, because you're the one who started the ministry you're in this place of leadership uh, but always be aware of what's happening be aware of uh, the doors that are there in your life there are those that we have to close close them immediately there are doors uh, that we have to ask the holy spirit to work in our lives do that immediately, right? Uh, then we saw how we can exercise spiritual authority uh, uh, by the presence of praise and worship, declare the finished work of the cross, identify and pull down strongholds. So that's what we did. Uh, we studied on, you know, um, different areas, different localities uh, that we are ministering in will have different kinds of strongholds. There will be different you know, the, the demonic oppression could be uh, varied in different places. So what you and I must do is we must identify areas or demonic strongholds. Like, you know, for example, it could be drug addiction, prostitution, uh, you know, uh, uh, anything that is prevalent, right? Uh, uh, unnatural death, 
is constantly happening. Uh, so these are those that we, we need to identify and pull down. Um, and so let's go into chapter 19, which is proclaiming the uncompromised gospel with power. Right. So even as you, you and I have planted the church, we, we are doing all that we have to do in the, in the natural, in the spiritual, uh, you and I, our main responsibility of starting a church, pioneering a church, is to proclaim the gospel. Right? Church is not about activities. It is not about conferences. We have conferences. We need them. We have youth meetings, men's ministry, women's ministry. We need all of it. But what is the reason for doing it? One, to proclaim the gospel, to, to bring people to a place of maturity, to grow together in Christ. Right? So Jesus himself instructed for the gospel to be proclaimed in power. Let's read Mark chapter 16, 15 through 20. Mark chapter 16, 15 through 20. Anybody can please read. Chapter 16, first. Yes, Mark 16, 15 through 20. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So, so then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. So we see here Jesus is, uh, is commissioning his disciples and he's saying, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel, and these signs will follow them. Right Now, it's very simple what Jesus is saying. If you preach the gospel, these signs will follow. Right. So sometimes what we do is we look at the reverse. We go behind science wonders, which is important. Uh, and then we, you know, we try to get people's attention and then we praise the gospel. Right. We know that there are different ways, but Jesus is saying here, firstly, preach the gospel, share the word, share the message, and then these signs will follow automatically. So when we are ministering either to individuals or to a congregation, life groups, whichever setting we are in, uh, be sure to preach and teach the word of God. Right? The word of God is what enables us, which sanctifies us. There are plenty of verses in the Bible which talks about the power of God's word. It says the word of God is like water, it refreshes, it's like hammer which breaks. Word of God is like a double-edged sword which penetrates our heart. Uh, so it is a word that can touch people's lives. It is a word which is living. It can really minister to people, right? So, uh, so proclaiming the uncompromised word of God. Get in, preach the gospel wherever you can, whenever you can. And when you're doing this, it will be followed by signs, wonders, and miracles. Right. Uh, when we proclaim the gospel, right now, for example, it is you know you just maybe a, a, a year you have pioneered your church, you've been preaching faithfully Sundays after Sunday, preparing, teaching, preaching, and you know there are times we we may feel discouraged. That's happened to me as well, right? You know, where we are preaching, we believe we want signs, wonders to happen, and sometimes it doesn't happen. But the Bible says that when we do this, God will follow it up with signs, wonders, and miracles. So, so expect 
signs, wonders, and miracles. Even if it, if you don't see it happening initially in your ministry, don't write it, write it off. Don't say, okay, maybe this is not what my ministry is. Maybe my ministry is only teaching, or my ministry is only preaching. Right? No, don't write it off. Right? You, you, we can never come to a place and say, okay, maybe I'm not the healing evangelist, or uh, you know, maybe that gift is not in me. No, each one of us, when we preach, when we teach the word of God, signs, wonders, and miracles will follow. We have to pursue for it. Right? And then when you teach it to your congregation, what did Jesus do? We look at his example. He taught. And when he taught them, he was they, they he built faith in their hearts and they began to believe. And uh, if you look at this simple example of Jesus with the five feeding the five thousand, what happened? Jesus said, Bring what you have, five loaves of bread, two fish. You bring it. And he instilled faith in them. He would have said, you know, don't worry, just go ahead and do what I tell you to do. And the disciples took it. And they, when they put their faith into practice, it is when the food was multiplied. Right. So as believers, as pastors and leaders, we are to do the same. Preach, teach, expect signs, wonders and miracles. Right. So proclaim the full gospel. Second way, second way of, re, of, of ministering to people is that we reason and demonstrate. We reason with people and demonstrate. Now, God has given us a mind, right? And we are to use our mind. So we are to think how we speak. We are to think how to reason. And the Apostle Paul did it at many places, right? Let's read a few of them here at Papas. Acts chapter 13, verse 6 to 12. Uh, maybe one person can open to Acts 17, 1 to 4. Right? And uh, Acts 17, 10 and 12 as well. Right? So these are examples of how, how Paul reasoned with people. Acts 13, 6 to 12. Acts 13, 6 to 12. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name, is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So you see here that uh, Paul, when he saw this person who was, you know, driven by a demonic spirit, Paul immediately by faith. And it says here, look straight at Elimus and said, you are the child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of deceit. And he, he not only reasoned what was happening, he understood what was happening, but he demonstrated power. He didn't say, I know who you are and walk away. But he said, I know what you're doing. I know that you are uh, you're, you're a spirit, an evil spirit that is uh, you know, prophesying and talking and doing all of this. Paul, filled with the Spirit, was able to, uh, you know, just uh, reason and he demonstrated the power of God uh, where darkness came upon him and he was blinded. Let's go to the next one. In Thessalonica, uh, Acts 17, 1 to 4. Go ahead. Anybody can read. Acts 17, 1 to 4. Now when they had passed through Amphi, Amphipolis and 
Apol Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Right. So here there's another, there's another portion here. Paul is in Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica is uh, Asia Minor, right? Now, these people are very, very learned. So it says here that Paul went as custom rules. He went into the synagogue, three Sabbaths, and he did three things. He explained, no, sorry, he reasoned, he explained, and he proclaimed. One, he reasoned with them. He explained it to them, and he proclaimed to them. Right. Proclaiming meaning demonstrated to them, right? Now, if you go down in the same chapter, Acts 10, uh, Acts 17, 10 onwards, is Berea, right? Uh, verse 10, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Bereans were of noble character uh, than the Thessalonians, but they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see what Paul was saying was true. So the Bereans, again, Paul reasoned with them, and they were no, more noble, right? So they were asking questions. What is he preaching? So they went back to the scriptures, and they and they saw, okay, it's what he's saying in line with the scriptures, right? When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching, uh, but look at verse 12. Many of the Jews believed and also did a prominent number of Greek men and women. By doing what? By just teaching and preaching. And just reasoning with the people. Many of them believed in the gospel. Right? There were Jews and there were uh, Greeks. Right. Let's go down. Acts 17 at Athens. Now, this is the most uh, uh, elaborate example and mainly used example when it comes to reasoning and giving a defense. Acts 17, Paul is in Athens and he's walking through Athens. He's looking at the place and he's saying he's seeing idols there and saying to an unknown God. And Paul goes in and he begins to reason with the people. Right. Uh, verse 24. The God who made this world, I sorry, let's go a verse before, verse 23. For I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship as unknown, I will make it known and I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven. And he goes on to explain. Right? So you see what's happening here? He's reasoning. Paul didn't, you know, what would be the wrong thing to do? Paul saying, hey, uh, you all are idol worshippers. You are, you'll have the wrath of God is coming upon you. You all, you know, God is a holy God, but you all are doing this. Uh, idol is an abomination to God. Uh, so now I'm going to share a message to you. You, if you, if you want to listen to it, please listen to it so that this is what will change your life. You don't see that too. Don't see him doing that. What is he doing? He's reasoning with them. He's using their context, their surroundings, their own people, their own culture, and he's reasoning and bringing in the gospel there. I see that you all are very religious, which is a good thing. I see that there's a God, there's a statue when you said to an unknown God. Now, what do you Feel is unknown, I am going to explain it to you. And he goes on to explain. Look at the last portion of this. Right? Verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear more. Verse 34, a few men became followers of Paul and believed. Can you believe that? 
few men became followers of Paul. Why? Because he reasoned with them. Was there any miracles? Was there any signs and wonders? No. No miracles, no signs, no wonders. Just the reasoning and preaching the word of God. Right? Let's go to Corinth. Acts chapter 18 and verse 4. From there he went to Corinth. Verse 4. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Right? So you see that the Apostle Paul, it was a habit for him. Wherever he went, he reasoned and then he demonstrated. Acts 18, 19 in Ephesus. What happens in Ephesus? Paul stayed on in Corinth and, uh, for some time. Then he left his brothers, sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. And 19, they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went up to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So you see that pattern? The Apostle Paul is following. Now, when we present the gospel, very important as pastors and leaders, be relevant to the people, be relevant to the place, to the setting that you are in. Now, let me give you this example. From days back, you know, uh, this elderly pastor had come home. And he had just happened to uh, come home. And, and so he came, he just shared a word. We told him, see, we are already Christians. You can maybe think of, uh, we just prayed with him. Uh, now, he's got a genuine heart and a genuine heart to serve God. But he's, uh, he's come from a more of a rural, a village setting. So what he would do is he would, uh, you know, take these musical instruments and what he did was he used to stand on the streets and sing and uh, play a song and all of that. Right? He would just stand and say, and he began to preach. Now, that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. Is it addressing the people in that place now remember that the city we stay in is um uh, is an urban city nobody has time right now i'm not saying what he's doing is wrong right? but what i'm saying is is it going to be effective right? and then eventually what happened people came out and scolded him and uh, and he, you know he felt bad and we all felt bad too but we need to strategize. We need to learn how to adapt. Now, I'm not blaming him because he's from a village background. He's been doing ministry for the past 30 years the same way. Uh, but you and I must adapt. We need to change according to what is happening around us. Right? We address people while we demonstrate the supernatural power of God. Right? We, so we need to develop that ability. Right? Now, what's happening now? If I don't improve myself, 10 years from now, if I'm doing the same, or one decade from now, if I'm doing the same thing, the same way of preaching or the same uh, you know, way of ministry, then something is wrong. I need to be improving. Because 10 years from now, a decade from now, things are going to be changing. There's going to be so much in terms of worship, uh, in terms of church, Probably there are new gadgets, new digital distributions, and all kinds of digital bug. Everything is going to come up, different ideas, different strategies. So we've got to be up to date. Right? So as casters, as leaders, we need to develop this ability. And then when we develop it, we can put it forth to our team members as well. And then they cast the vision. Right? Next point that we talk about is breaking controlling powers. Right? We talked about this last class, but let's just quickly look at it. Every place uh, has certain authority that the devil has. Right? Every area, uh, there are authorities, there are strongholds that the devil has. Right? Now, when you and I as believers enter into those places, we uh, we usher in the presence of God through praise and worship, prayer, preaching, demonstration of the gospel, 
supernatural signs and wonders. We break the influence of those controlling powers or those strongholds over people. And we talked about this. Philip preached in Samaria and, uh, and in Samaria and Simon the sorcerer. Right? So we know that in Samaria, sorcery would have been one of those uh, strongholds. So Philip preached and uh, Simon was, uh, you know, restored back. Paul and Barnabas demonstrated and preached the gospel uh, in Acts 13. Again, sorcery. Uh, Philippi was the slave girl, slavery, right? Uh, and, and in Ephesus, dethroned the control of Goddess Diana over the people. So we see that at different places, just like what's happened in the uh, early church, even now, wherever we are, wherever we have been, we are, you know, in ministry or we are living in localities that we are in, there are strongholds in and around. And so these strongholds will begin to lose its grip when you and I usher in the presence of God. Right? So here's the thing that we can do as a church, get together, pray together, five days of prayer, or now that everyone is busy, you can choose uh, you know, worship night, worship evening, come together, spend time to bring in the presence of God. Right now, we may be doing something in the natural, right? maybe prayer and worship, but remember that in the spiritual, something is happening. Right. In the spirit, so we may not see it, we may not or see it immediately as well. We may not understand what's happening in the spiritual, and so something is happening. Right? So we well, chapter 20, you and I are to equip the saints for this. It is not a one man's job. Right? We can't go about praying everywhere in the city and say, okay. I alone will go and pray, and those strongholds will break. No. The Lord Jesus himself built a team, so we equip our church members. Uh, I was thinking about this today, you know. The day you start your ministry is the day you need to plan your exit. Meaning, you should have that in your mind, that, hey, not there. There should be, the ministry should go on. The people should be there. Paul chose Timothy when he was 17 years old, probably about 17, and raised him up to be a good leader. He was only in his second missionary journey. He just probably did eight or almost a year of ministry. That's it. But he knew that he needed these people. They are going to take on the ministry going forward. So equip saints, empower them, and release them. First one, how do you equip the saints? Do you make them stand with you the whole day? Or make them do all your work for the whole day? No, you teach God's word. The local church must feed people with the word of God, with the truth of God's word. And with that comes wisdom, knowledge, understanding, power, strength, holiness. Everything will flow out of it. Teach God's word. Never come to a place as pastors where we don't have the time to teach God's word. So one thing that we intentionally do at APC is, if you notice uh, our sermons, we we don't add any personal examples. It's only in the Bible college setting just to help us learn. This is a different setting, so we use personal examples. Uh, examples that are there around us, but in a church setting on Sundays, Sunday morning, we we preach the word. Forty-five minutes or fifty minutes of the word is being preached, all locations, right? Because it is a word that will empower people. It is a word that will build people up. The local church must uphold God's truth in the society and in the world. So as a church, we uphold God's word. Say, okay, we stand by the things that God says in his word. And we will preach by the things what God says in his word. Now, people may accept, people may reject. 
we don't have the ability to control that but we do have the ability of what we preach and teach we afford and teach god's word so right now when you look at the gen z right and you have some young boys and girls and they come up to you and they say uh, is being a lesbian wrong or is being gay wrong is gay marriage wrong now you got a choice right you say I, the answer is either yes or no right and to follow that up we always have got uh, god's word to teach them to to reason with them but that hard heart is able to minister and to you know sometimes we think these are things that we must only reason no sometimes we just need to give a word just giving a bible verse can really touch their lives teach the truth of god's word i'm not saying everyone is going to accept it because that's what happened to jesus he was teaching the truth and again his disciples were teaching the truth what did they do they rejected his message but those who received his message saw the blessings of god in their life All right so teach god's word let that be number one priority in your church number one look at this example the church in corinth you know also studying about uh, the church in corinth uh, the corinthians the episodes of the corinthians the church in corinth was flowing in all the gifts of the spirit but paul says you are immature i need to feed you milk so you're not yet ready for the word for the food of god's word why because they had all the gifts there's no maturity maturity comes in by teaching god's word right you can have a person who is flowing in all the gifts of the spirit yet be immature so the gifts of the spirit is not something that we measure our you know our, our ministry with or our spiritual life gifts of the spirit is important that's not what we measure see the church in corinth they they had all the gifts yet there was division there was strife they didn't know how to handle the lord's table this confusion within the church but the word of god is what brings connection to place emphasis also on the supernatural as god's people you and i as a pastor especially we need to manifest the supernatural we need to pray and ask god to release the supernatural in us and through us right now here's the thing if sometimes there's a there's a blockage in our mind which the enemy puts the enemy will say hey you are not a healing evangelist or or healing deliverance word of knowledge prophetic these are all for pastors who are who have 500 people or 1000 people in the church you are only 50 people in your church so this is not yet for you that's a lie from the enemy nowhere in the bible has jesus said only when your ministry grows you will see signs wonders and miracles right when jesus had 12 disciples when he went to places initially he was probably preaching to 10 15 people this is signs wonders and miracles so Place an emphasis on the supernatural. You know, when you and I, as pastors, when we teach, right? So, for example, you're teaching about God's word. You're, you're teaching about, hey, you know what Moses did? He he parted the seas into two, and the people of Israel walked through it. You know what uh, what happened to Daniel? He was in the lion's den. Not one lion tried to attack him. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. they were put into the fire but the fire did not burn them look at jesus he walked on the water nobody else did that he said to the waters peace be still he 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 took five loaves of bread to feed the thousands he raised up the dead now what are we doing all of a sudden we have now we believe it we are convinced of it we we are preaching it you are encouraging the church to tap into the supernatural 
there is a supernatural god is a supernatural god right so we are encouraging the congregation not to look at things in the natural alone but to also look into the supernatural encourage people to pursue that right uh, pursue god's presence now here's another important thing don't pursue only you know, god when will i see gifts when will i see miracles that's not what we want we pursue god what does the verse say in mark that we read these signs will follow you if you preach the gospel if you preach god's word the signs themselves will follow you right we pray we preach let the signs follow right three we equip god's people to be salt and light show them how to be the salt how to be the light teach them you, you and i set the example and then we teach so for example you know we have our um, men's ministry right uh, and something that we always do is we have one is a men's conference yearly conference and then we have quarterly men's breakfast fellowship so what we do is we we touch on topics that men really don't get to talk about right so the most men are working monday to friday they're looking after the house things in the house that need to get done and so we try to talk about things that men go through how can i be a godly man how can i be a godly husband a good father uh, all of these points which may not be taught on sunday morning but we even if they are taught we, we just go deeper into these points we teach equip people uh, then we have professionals conference where we equip people on how to live a godly life in the corporate world right how to say no to uh, to you know to things that are not of god how to be obedient how to be a testimony how to be a salt and light in the corporate world and we equip them we we teach them people who are trained come and teach uh, so equip your people right and if you are equipping for ministry you know, like group leaders cell group leaders and now eventually youth leaders volunteer team leaders get them equip them right uh, especially when it comes to leadership in the church uh, you know you'll have to make certain decisions right so how to make those decisions when to make a decision all these things we can learn now, i'm not saying that you know we know everything and we make the right decisions no there are times we have made wrong decisions and we learn from them right and so be as leaders be open to even sharing places where you have failed because you're letting them know that hey it's not like i'm you know uh, uh you know, i'm infallible or something right even i make mistakes as a leader even i went through this uh, but you're learning together right equip god's people for evangelism right? again there are many ways that we can evangelize equip them for that and right? uh, empower sorry equip empower and send right uh, equip them empower them say okay now you go and you teach and you preach right and then send them out to impact uh, and again equipping the saints uh, we need a lot of uh, volunteers we need we can do a lot of events right now without the events we won't be able to equip them right we need them right uh, uh, we're not saying no to events and conferences. We need them. Uh, but even as you meet in a conference or event, make sure that uh, the time is used in a right way, the teaching is done in the right way, and it will be effective. People will remember, oh, hey, this two days conference that I went for was, you know, I learned this from God's word. Right? Uh, or if it's a pastor's conference, uh, this two days conference, I learned how to. Uh, you know, be a good leader and things that I must do in as a leader, personal life and character as a leader. Right. So make it meaningful. Uh, those two, those days, those conferences, events, uh, make it meaningful. Right. So uh, when we do that, we know okay, the time, the day, the conference is is blessing people's life, and then eventually you'll see you will see that impact. Right. You will see. People in your church, they are changing, they're going stronger, they're, they're growing in maturity. What they were five years back, 
they're completely different now. They understand. They're, uh, they're depending on God. They're stronger in the spirit. We will see it in our life. Uh, let's quickly do chapter 21, uh, the citywide church. Now, when we start a local church in a city, we usually spend a lot of time in this in your church, right? You're still trying to develop the church. Uh, you're still trying to build a church. The first three, four years, it's very important. You're building trust among your congregation, um, you know, strategizing, getting things in place administratively. Uh, getting things in place. Now, even as you do that, always keep in mind that you are part of a bigger body as well, right, within the church. So one, you can look for ways to build trust and strengthen relationships with other churches. Now, even as you do that, right, uh, you know, we can probably go meet pastors, get other pastors to come and share, but be wise on how you do this, right? Uh, don't be in a hurry right, to invite somebody to come and preach. Make sure that uh, you know that, that the preaching teaching is done in the right way. Give them guidelines. Now, see the reason is I've heard this once. Our pastor said this to us. You know, it takes years of hard work to build a ministry, but. If something that is done and said in a wrong way, it'll just take a few moments for it to crumble down. Few moments. Your years of hard work, few moments can just crumble up. Like, or something wrongly said or something, uh, you know, anything, right? Done or said. So look for ways to strengthen and build relationships, build trust. Now, there are times. People would, wouldn't want to, uh, you know, involve with you as a church, involve with you, or maybe you feel it's not the right time to involve together at this church. It's all right. It's not like you're disobeying God's word. Right? But there'll be times God will orchestrate things, right? Orchestrate ministries to come together, work together, right? And uh, and we do that at ABC. Right? We, we have certain ministries that we work together, support each other as well in in the ministry, find ways to strengthen and serve other churches uh, in the city and outside the city as well. Right? Uh, uh, and so, if you, if there are some, you know, I remember many, many years back, there was this ministry which reached out to uh, the children from, uh, you know, uh, from the slums. And the way they reached out was through football, soccer. Right, so they would, every morning they would go out, play soccer, and then after soccer, give them some refreshments, and then share a gospel message. And this way, many of them became believers. Now, this person who was leading this ministry was part of our church, uh, but she had a job as well. Right? So, but she really wanted to equip these uh, young boys, young boys. Right? So the, slowly that became 20, 30 people, 50 people. Ministry, the children started growing. Many people believed in Jesus, but now they need a good study. So I remember, I'm talking about 2015, uh, 2014, 2015. Uh, what we used to do is we used to go, we had a, they had a small office. They would go there uh, uh, somewhere around 8 o'clock in the morning. We would go there. We would teach them for one hour. Right, who we are in Christ foundations, teach them the word of God, one hour. And I think it was alternate days. I'm not sure the days, but uh, uh, but we would go there and teach. Right. And and so we had, what we were doing was we were helping out these other ministries. Right. All we did was teaching them the word of God, but they were so blessed. They were, we would give them our publications, free books. Uh, they would, you know, they were so happy to receive that. And, uh, uh, and again, they were strengthened in the word. So even as you uh, build your church, build your ministry, uh, you know, it's very important that you have a kingdom mindset. Right? Yes, it's your ministry, your church. Also think about how you can be an impact for the kingdom of God together in the body of Christ. And so some of the books recommended reading is Kingdom Builders uh, from uh, you know, Pastor's uh, 
written a book on kingdom builders. Uh, you can just go to the website and download that as well. And another book would be Divine Order in the Citywide Church, where uh, we talk about how you and I, as leaders and pastors, must maintain order in the citywide church. And so these two books are good recommended reading. So uh, do take time. You can just download the PDF and read it. I know that Kingdom Builders, you may have already completed as a course, but um, you can read it again, Kingdom Builders and uh, Divine Order in the Citywide Church. All right, so any questions, any thoughts before we close? All right, okay, so let's just close in prayer and uh, and I hope uh, the study is, uh, you know, you're able to grasp. And um, I really encourage each one of us, if God has given us the vision to start a church or start a ministry, you know, just apply these things, begin to step out in faith. And I'm sure God will uh, work in our lives. Let's pray before we close. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us. And even as we go about our day and our week, Lord, I pray that you will continue, Lord, to speak to our hearts. Let there be new plans and purposes birthed in our heart, Lord. Thank you that, Lord, you are always with us. You will strengthen us. You will empower us, God. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week ahead. I'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Pastor.